I'm Besa Luce, and welcome to K2.0's podcast, Other Talking Points. In this episode, I will be looking at the ways we talk about the relationship between Kosovo and Serbia. It's a topic we in the region hear about on an almost daily basis. But sometimes it seems there's a dominant narrative that the media and policymakers use almost on autopilot. Especially since 2011, the dominant framework for talking Kosovo and Serbia has been in the context of the EU-mediated dialogue. As such, the focus has tended to rely on the statements and interpretations of politicians and political actors, on the number of agreements signed and the extent to which they are being implemented, on whether the two countries are processing in their EU integration agenda, and of course on the repeated flare-ups of tensions, as we have seen these past couple of months in the north of Kosovo. From time to time, the media might report on cultural cooperation, instances of economic integration or citizen-based initiatives. But such reports are few and far between, and often disappear amid the constant flow of sensationalist or conflict-driven narratives. Are there other stories and narratives that go beyond ethnic enmity and EU diplomatic bureaucracy? Though there appears to be little academic exchange or collaboration between the two countries, The recently published book, Kosovo Serbia, A Different Approach, is trying to bring scholars from the two countries together to challenge preconceived notions, confront historical revisionism, and propose some common narratives. Published by the Musine Kokolari Institute for Social Policy in Pristina and the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory in Belgrade, the book proposes progressive perspectives on pressing social, economic, and ecological questions with the aim of showing similarities between Serbs and Albanians through shared contemporary struggles and concerns. To discuss the book and new frameworks for discussing Kosovo and Serbia relations, I have here with me two of the publication's main initiators. Visaru Mere, an activist, analyst and politician who served as the deputy leader of the Socialist Democratic Party of Kosovo. He also served as the leader of Vedvendosia in Kosovo between 2015 and 2018. Now he runs the Musine Kokolari Institute for Social Policy, a think tank promoting social democratic values in Kosovo. And Aleksandr Pavlovich, senior researcher at the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, University of Belgrade. His main research interests are cultural history of the Balkans, Serbian and Balkan oral and written tradition, Serbian-Albanian relations, and traditional Balkan society. Visar, thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Aleksandr, great to have you as well. Thank you very much. Soon, Falemindarit. Okay, so I would like to begin with the, with the publication and to begin with something uh, that the two of you do together in the foreword uh, of the book, where I think that you very much question the very premise and foundation of the current normalization of relations framework between Kosovo and Serbia. And uh, in this regard, you establish that the current umbrella of a new liberal political ideology has contributed to the region being seen and treated merely in terms of geostrategic interests, and that a number of issues such as individual or collective freedoms, economic, social well-being of citizens are, are also suffering as a result. So what was for the two of you the alternative premise upon which you approached and created this book, and uh, how did your institutions come together in this process? Well, this idea was uh, actually uh, talked about for a very long time. Uh, first, uh, we as Institute uh, discussed uh, uh, what can we do in this direction? So the idea was not really clear to us of what should be done, but can we do something in order to uh, try and present a different picture of uh, what the, not just what the relations are, but uh, also what they can be and what they should be, which is the most important uh, factor of our uh, thinking at that time. And then we contacted with the Institute with Sasha and Philip, and together with them, uh, we uh, joined forces in order to come up with the idea first and then uh, implement it as it uh, 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 culminated in the conference in Pristina and the book that was uh, that was published. Uh, I, on a procedural, I would say, and practical level, it wasn't uh, that easy because at the same time we were facing pandemic restrictions and therefore a lot of our timetable was uh, had to be moved uh, because we wanted to fit this sort of uh, uh, discussion and uh, to start talking about these things in public uh, uh, at the same time when things were happening in the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia. As we know, always something happens in that uh, 
in that uh, table, but uh, never sufficiently enough in order for it to be uh, to be over. So, uh, in, in, uh, from our perspective, we wanted to uh, challenge or uh, question whether the ideology within which the dialogue happens has anything to do with its lingering, and whether the, this sort of a dialogue, uh, because it is confined on the political level and is uh, very much untransparent and to an extent undemocratic as well, whether that is uh, the way to move forward in order for us in the region, and especially Kosovo and Serbia, uh, to go to reap the fruits of uh, transformation of our societies rather than just reaching a deal between Kosovo and Serbia. So in these terms, we think that uh, although the agreement between Kosovo and Serbia is not an easy issue, although that might and will be reached at some point, uh, we think that that is just a small step in uh, towards what we need. And what we need is uh, the implementation, not just of the agreement, but also of the logic of having the two people living with each other, cooperating with each other for a better future. So in this sense, we were trying to discuss two things at the same time uh, through the book. So identify those spaces or those issues where people can cooperate regardless of their ethnic and cultural backgrounds. And also to see whether talking about the future is much more uh, important and an easier way to reach an agreement rather than uh, 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 reading or misreading, as uh, Sasha always says, uh, the past and the history of our uh, two people. So in a nutshell, I would say these were the initial ideas uh, that uh, that uh, uh, were uh, were at the at the center of uh, the, the the main idea of uh, producing this or publishing this book and having these two conferences that we had in Belgrade and Pristina. So we started, we started talked about you talked about uh, what the relations can be and what they should be. But I am going to go a bit in the past with with you, Alexander, because you also have uh, a text in the in, in the book yourself that you have written when you talk about what the relations also have been. And when you talk about the way those relations have uh, have been, you you really use it as a moment to 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 challenge what we know of today that these relations between Kos uh, Albanians and Serbs were not always based on enmity. They were not always conflictuous in that sense. And you're also tackling, in, I think, also just the, the, the great historical revisionism, the, not only of the past 20, 30 years, but from dating back to the Ottoman Empire. So can you talk a bit uh, uh, about that uh, and what you say also in, in, in your text and how important it is to also have a more diverse and multi-perspective understanding of history as well. Uh, I would just like to add to uh, Visar's very succinct uh, introduction that uh, in addition to trying to find some common topics to, to, to discuss between Serbs and Albanians, we also try to compose this book in a, a slightly unorthodox manner because we had like six main topics and we uh, try to find one scholar or intellectual or public figure uh, uh, from the Serbian side and one from the Albanian side, basically to offer their views on the same topic. So in that sense, I, I think if you don't want to read this book from covers to covers, it might be interesting if you find one topic that is, you know, maybe interesting for you, I don't know, uh, dealing with the past or ecology or economy or something like that. Uh, to see how someone from Pristina and someone from Belgrade think about the same issue. And I think the content of the book really shows that once we ask uh, uh, similar questions, once we ask questions that uh, in a way uh, connect both, both nations, you know, thinking, uh, uh, thoughts, solutions, uh, uh, problems look pretty much pretty much similar. So that, I think, would be, uh, for me, one of the, you know, really interesting and beneficial things potentially uh, from this, this book and project. Now, if you're asking me about uh, uh, my concrete article, I have been, in a way, trying to counter the dominant perspective in the perception between Serbs and Albanians, which is, as you said, it's hostile. It's it's filled with enmity, and there is like an idea that uh, uh, that anything about Serbs and Albanians 
is a zero-sum game. What is good for, for Serbs is bad for Albanians and, and vice versa. And I think the perception of, of many young people who have virtually no contact. Now we are in a situation where young people are forming their views almost exclusively based on prejudices, stereotypes, and media. They are not traveling, they are not you know, learning languages or anything of the sort. Their per perception is very hostile and antagonistic. And my article was basically based on what happens if we ask this question in a diachronical perspective, or if this sounds a bit too, uh, 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 you know, scholarly, is the situation that we are experiencing now something that was really going on for decades and centuries or not? And when you ask the question in that manner, the answer is pretty simple. What we now perceive as hostility between Serbs and Albanians, this big rift between us, is something very, very recent in historical terms. Actually, if you go back in the past as long as, as you wish, you can argue that Serbs and Albanians lived together. And by together, I mean they lived uh, jointly, not as, as neighbors, as two uh, uh, geographically, territorially uh, 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 separated communities or, ed or entities. They lived really mixed within these Balkans and more so in the same political formations. Since the arrival of, of Slavs and the Serbs in the Balkans, Serbs and Albanians lived for five centuries under Byzantine sovereignty. Within, you know, one scholar calls it uh, the Byzantine Commonwealth because it, you know, the 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 level of independence was uh, 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 developed to various degree. But for 500 years, we were part of the same Byzantine civilization. Then, during the the Nemanjic period. You can argue that there was a, a Serbian dominant, but again, this was a feudal uh, society, not national or ethnic society. And we have numerous examples of, of joint marriages of Serbian and Albanian aristocracy having a, a, a joint lineage. Therefore, uh, in this period of 200 years, again, there is no trace of any major conflict between uh, uh, Serbs and Albanians. You have historical battles between Serbs and Hungarians, between uh, 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 the Byzantines or the Greeks, between Bulgarians, but there is not nothing uh, as ca some kind of Serbian-Albanian conflict. I could name numerous examples. I guess Skanderbeg is the, the best known example. His mother from a Serbian feudal family, his father was from an Albanian one, and in the famous League of Leisure, uh, uh, which is called like the you know the, the gathering of the Albanian nobility in order to fight the Turks. Uh, not all of them were Albanians, ethnically speaking. There were also representatives of Balšić and Crnojević family, which are so mixed and intertwined that it's really you know it's it's really un unsuitable to use any uh, uh, nowadays national categories. In approaching these things, then again, in the next four or five hundred years, we again lived within the Ottoman Empire, and you know, many things were told about Pax Ottomana, whether this was a you know a, a good times or a bad times. But again, the fact is that there is no big rebellion, uprising, war during these centuries that we could describe as Serbian conflict with Albanians or Albanian conflicts with with the Serbs. More so, and I will conclude this first part uh, uh, with this, uh, if you look at how people lived in the Balkans, most Serbs and most Albanians nowadays have their lineage, their origin from the highlands, from, from the tribal communities, which is nowadays uh, Montenegro and uh, uh, Northern Albania, Malaysia. And uh, there, people lived in in a very, very similar way and manner. If you look at Kanun uh, uh, of uh, Leka Dukajin or Montenegrin and Serbian customs, they are the same. If you look at Marko Miljanov at his 
examples of heroism. He ascribes as many examples of heroism and virtues and uh, 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 bravery and so on to Albanians as to the Serbs. So I could go on for for uh, uh, hours and hours like any scholar, uh, I guess. But the fact is that throughout history, we live together and within the same political formations with the uh, upsides and downsides. But again, our history is by no means saturated with violence and antagonism as many nowadays claim or would like us to believe. Thanks, uh, thanks for that, Alexander. And actually, also in the book, something that is mentioned that I found very, uh, very interesting because it also served to myself as a reminder that actually there's in in the context of let's say a very long history, there's been less mutual conflicts between Serbs and Albanians than there's been between some Western uh, countries in in Europe. And we tend to we tend to forget that uh, I, I think. And also there is this dominant narrative now that makes us believe that we've always been in war or in fights uh, uh, with one another, which I think also we could bring in here Maria Todorova, <laughs> like imagining the Balkans uh, and all of that. And I would like to connect this maybe also with uh, the foundation of the, the dialogue as well, being an EU-mediated dialogue. Does it, the dialogue in the way it's structured, Visar, uh, does it, is it based on this premise that, uh, do you think that the premise of uh, how it's been set up is that there's this underlying uh, very uh, deep-rooted hatred, let's say, that uh, upon which then a solution has to be uh, proposed and found? Well, I think it is. I think that the mentality, the political mentality, unfortunately, of all the political actors in this scene, so starting from uh, Western mediators to politicians in Serbia and in Kosovo, is uh, falls within this uh, uh, logic, within this paradigm. <clears throat> the Western powers has always... Uh, uh, sort of like considered uh, the Balkans in a way as this uh, time bomb. So people in the Balkans uh, have the same mentality when it comes to fighting and uh, killing each other and ravishing each other. Uh, so in this sense, and I think that uh, uh, they were they were sort of like counterparted uh, with uh, beliefs, uh, with the misreadings of history, as Alexander pointed out, on both sides. So in Serbia, uh, uh, so Serbian political history claims that since the Battle of Kosovo, Serbia has always been in war with not Albanians only, but with everybody who wanted to uh, to uh, change uh, the religion and the identity of Europe. And at the same time, Albanians claimed uh, the same thing uh, from Skanderbeg and onwards. We were the protectors of Christian Europe from uh, Ottoman Muslims. So in this sense, I think that uh, even in this misreading of history, we have a similar or same misreading of history. But if you read that uh, at the history of uh, the official, if I may call it, or the mainstream history of Albanians, it is very interesting to see that there is a huge gap from Skanderbeg to 1912. There are 500 years of our history that we don't know much about. We don't talk much about, apart from some uh, 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 upheavals that uh, have been organized in different parts, populated by Albanians against the Ottoman Empire. So in this sense, I think that this was uh, 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 intentionally constructed in order to have its political and nationalistic uh, uh, function. Uh, and uh, by, 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 as such, I think that especially with us Albanians, but I would say with Serbs to an extent as well, uh, we have come to to uh, to build a national identity which is very much negative. So basically, we are what we are because we're not the other. It's it's very visible in even in our, in our everyday uh, discourse when we talk about the identity. More often than not, we say we're Albanians because we're not like Serbs, we're not like them, we're not like this, we're not. So uh, so this uh, a negative identification has become the culture and the norm. And I think that uh, this, you can find traces of this in the way that the dialogue is being viewed as well. And unfortunately, again, not just by us, because the dialogue and its intensity, like we are seeing an intensity now in dealings with the dialogue, you know, a lot of pressure from United States of America, and yeah, European Union, it has this negative identification as well. So basically why we need an agreement with Serbia is not something that is going to pave a way for a better future for both people, but it is something that is going to uh, uh, help us or it is going to prevent 
the war. So basically, again, an agreement is not seen as a cooperation between people. An agreement is seen as an agreement not to fight with each other, which uh, this mentality says that the norm would have been that they always fight among each other. So we need to change this through an agreement in order for them not to fight all the time. And I think that this negative identification has, has uh, posed a lot of problems to the dialogue itself and to the agreement itself, as we are seeing it now. So, for example, if we are convinced that by being troublemakers, we gain more, then both parties are going to use its utmost impossible in order to become troublemakers. And I think that this is one of the explanations of what is happening in the North currently. And uh, in this sense, I think that uh, apart from this political aspect, the most important thing is that, uh, as Alexander has pointed out, uh, this misreading of history is actually maintaining, I think, even to the day, of the hostilities between Serbs and Albanians without knowing the history as it was and without being able to communicate directly and to identify and work together on things of common interest, and there are many things that are of common interest, uh, we have become uh, a, a society, and I'm talking for Kosovo now, uh, where we live formally under the same territory, under the same government and rule, but we don't actually live with each other. The vast majority of people in Kosovo do not speak Serbian. And uh, I would say a very few Serbs in Kosovo speak Albanian. And you have the same situation in Presheva, for example, as well. So basically, there are a lot of obstacles in order for us to be able to start communicating as not just as neighbors, as Alexander pointed out, but as people in the same region which have the same, uh, I would say, uh, uh, interest in common for the future. Alexander, you yourself were also critical, I think, of the of the dialogue and the the framework of the the, the dialogue in the public publication, and I think you you question the very need for a political agreement as the means towards reconciliation, and you argue that what is needed is a change. Uh, now I'm going to quote you: a change that enters the hearts and minds of the people and forces them to soften, soften, and start perceiving each other in a different way. How I mean, how to do this when when you take also into account. Uh, every, that everything else in our societies somehow goes against this. Whether we're talking about school textbooks in both societies, they provide very single-based in instead of multi-perspective history teachings, or there's also historical revisionism. The, we know the problems with the with the media in in both countries. There is the element not just of sensationalism, but uh, of prejudice uh, uh, that is often uh, that is often built. So, how would you see this uh, changing the hearts and minds of the people? Okay, uh, first, uh, a, a bit of hedging, you know, I'm a scholar, I'm not a political analyst. Asking me how to do something is in a way similar asking it, you know, a, a, a theoretical physicist, you know, okay, how to make this particle, you know, like, I don't know, guys, I'm just doing the numbers, you know, like, uh, I'm predicting this particle and, you know, someone else should do an experiment and try to find it. <clears throat> but joke on the side, uh, of course, I'm not by no means against the dialogue. I mean, dialogue in the wider sense is a form that we are we are having, uh, uh, you know, during this, this podcast. And of course, dialogue is needed. I was simply voicing, uh, I would say, a really, uh, uh, you know, common sense uh, 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 worry, concern that once our politicians sign something and even implement it, is this going to solve all the questions? I think politicians are focusing on the very uh, uh, b uh, 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 basic political solutions, okay? And once this is done, I think all this that we were talking about, hostility, perception of enmity, uh, 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 bad sentiments, you know, contested historical narratives, uh, th I'm afraid this is all going to remain. One signature or one agreement is not going to resolve that. Now, if you want me, I will get out of my comfort sphere and uh, uh, say some examples that have uh, good consequences. Uh, one example is uh, a Franco-German cooperation office that was founded, I don't know, in mid-50s 
in order to help reconciliation. And it had hundreds of thousands of projects, most of which have uh, uh, youth exchanges. Throughout the course of the last 50 or 60 years, they managed to bring millions and millions of French people to Germany and German people to France to organize joint activities. So you created consciously, deliberately, a whole new generation of people who had uh, uh, direct physical, verbal contact with their so-called enemy. So that's what, what was perceived as enmity when people are together for, for a week or two weeks, when they eat, sleep together, you know, have a little bit of crush, hear some lectures, think about alternative uh, options. They are not prone to have uh, to, to perpetuate the same perceptions. And so far, I, I've seen only words, but very little deeds in this sense of let us really try to have our young people uh, 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 connect with each other. That would be one big thing if we can do it in, uh, in big numbers. Another thing that we can see examples of uh, uh, look at how young Germans are brought up nowadays. You know, they have textbooks that are aligned with the French textbooks. We are a thousand years away from that mentally. But who is to say if there is a real will that a decent group of people could not come up with some content that would be uh, 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 valid and useful for, for both groups? So our textbooks, our whole education perpetuates this hostility. If we could have some change there, that would again pre, uh, help bringing up new generations in a different spirit. Excellent thing is visits. I can tell you, I lived in Belgrade for, I don't know, 30 years or so. Uh, most people in Belgrade have never been to a mosque. I've seen friends and colleagues when there is the night of the museums, if you know that manifestation, when like everything is open, they are trying to enter the mosque that on the night of the museum and it's like jammed and everything. And this mosque has been there for centuries. That level of ignorance towards certain part of your uh, uh, history, geography, your your habitus, as, as Bourdieu would say, you know, like your being, uh, is tantalizing. Serbs go to Stop me at any time. Uh, Serbs go to Kosovo through these pilgrimage travels. They have a bus which is designed with a uh, you know spiritual music. They visit Orthodox places. What they visit is this uh, uh, medieval or imaginary Kosovo that Serbs tend to have in their heads. They don't visit Pristina. They don't visit. Prizren, they don't go to Charshi, they don't see real, you know, hundreds of thousands of real Albanians living in Kosovo. So they're only seeing one very limited picture. I am sure that uh, uh, I've seen some schools in Pea uh, where Albanian children are going, pupils going to see the patriarchy of, of Pech, you know, and that's a good example. If our communities could do that, you know, uh, uh, Isa Boletini's grave is in, in northern Midrovica. It's not properly marked because Serbs are uh, 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 confronting that and they see that as a problem. So if we could have these uh, uh, spaces of, of common joint memory, joint history that would be visited and revisited, I would say initiatives like that have a good chances of a positive outcome. You know, but that means having this will, real will among ourselves. And that is not simply, so that's why I think uh, no political agreement among two leaders is going to solve this. And to conclude this re very, uh, you know, uh, long discourse that I had, yes, I always emphasize Germany, France, and England they had so much more wars and casualties. Only the Battle of Somme, one battle in the First World War, had more casualties than the entire Balkan history. Okay? And if you don't believe me, 
I can I can do the maths about it. But they had a will to change it. And now they're young generations. It's not like that they're ignorant, but they don't buy this hostility. Their identity is not founded on precisely what Visar said. It's not founded on antagonism. It's not founded on opposition to the other. You know, you are a German and a European and you have your original identity and these layers are intertwined. Our young generations are still pretty much hostile. They go to football stadiums. They, you know, make all the mess. This is where we are failing. And this is where we need to put a lot of effort and patience in order to bring up one generation in the Balkans that will not buy this hostility as their source of identity. And that's exactly actually where I wanted to connect on the issue of identity. And we start maybe... Uh, I- can continue with with you because the way I see it, I think that as a result also of a lot of the unresolved political issues from the wars of the 90s, um, the ethnic marker of one's identity I, across the region, I think it's only become a, become st- stronger and it's more more present, it's more manifested. And I think it's somehow a result of, also uh, of that. And, some, and it seems at moments that we haven't been fully able to embrace identities around citizenship and around uh, around citizenry. And you talked earlier about, uh, especially Albanians, how they view their identity always, you explained it or uh, the way you see it in comparison to, to, to others. But how do you see the Kosovo identity coming into uh, play here, Kosovo Albanian identity? Are there, how, how can new understandings of citizenship uh, pre- prevail, whether in Kosovo but, or Kosovo, Serbia, but also in the larger context of the uh, of the of the region. Well, I think that uh, the original idea of Kosovo actually was to be a citizen-based society uh, with this uh, this uh, within this identity of a Kosovo, which was more of a political identity uh, rather than an ethnic one. But I think that uh, it's really strange. I, I sometimes uh, see that uh, we live in a very uh, sort of like paradoxical uh, world. Uh, today, it's very easy for ourselves individually to uh, take this idea of liquid identities. And we do that on a daily basis. Everybody does that. You know, We change our identities. We switch identities. We, it's very easy for us to, you know, to just uh, uh, take your things and move and go live in Germany. But then we become very conservative when it comes to collective identity. So basically, we are very easily telling ourselves one of the days that Today I'm Kosovo, or maybe tomorrow I'm Albanian. On the third day I'm French, and on the fourth day I support Argentina when they win the World Cup. And we don't see a problem with that at all. But when it comes to our collective identity, which is usually perceived as something that the others should do and are obliged to do, they should remain proper historical beings. And you see this very much with our diaspora, especially the Kosovo diaspora. I mean, they live in Germany for 30 years. They speak German better than they speak Albanian. And they tell us on a daily basis, you should remain Albanian and don't change that, which is, you know, very strange. I mean, something, uh, 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 how should I say, a responsibility which should be borne by the others, but not necessarily by yourself. So in this sense, I think that we are actually changing our identities. Uh, the issue is that uh, we don't really understand or we not anymore, uh, uh, what, uh, what, uh, what is the central identity and how are we going to build that? Because I think that, again, we are living in a very atomized world and this is one of the problems, the ideological problems that we also try to discuss through the book, uh, where uh, individuals are actually left on their own. So sources of information today are very diverse and on a daily basis less credible. And in this sense, I mean, it is up to the person individually in Belgrade or Nish or Sombor or Pristina or Prizren or even Tirana to decide what version of Albanianism or Serbianism or regional history is the credible one. And this is very risky. And we've seen this on, throughout the world, especially, for example, through you know, the discussion with vaccines and the, after, the vaccines. And, everything. and I think that this is uh, becoming a problem in our situation as well uh, because uh, today we have... Uh, 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 the most inappropriate people talking about issues such as identity, uh, collective action, collective power, uh, politics, uh, coexistence. 
You have religious leaders who are very active on this. Uh, you have uh, uh, some dubious, uh, sort of like uh, self-called historians. Uh, you have uh, the people from, uh, how should I say, uh, the uh, Estrada. And these are the people that actually talk more about identities, let's say, you know, people like Alexander, uh, university professors, you know, uh, well-acclaimed uh, historians. And I think that we need to think how to bring this back. And on what level can we bring intellectuals who should become a bit more brave in order to tackle these issues and pose these questions and then have a credible debate on them? Because the way that we are going and with the current debate that we are having, I don't see any changes possible. And where is the role of politicians here? The most problematic role is that there are people that have the popularity and credibility. Therefore, they can make things happen. But then at the same time, they see that changing and transforming his, uh, societies would mean their demise because they are used to live in certain societies and gain the votes from particular kind of people that they then uh, sort of like feed in order to maintain this uh, this uh, uh, this situation. So in this sense, yes, I mean, uh, what changes can or should be uh, made, I think that uh, we need to think of identity, not just in terms of how we historically have constructed it, but also in terms of how we want to build that in the future. Right? For example, why is an Albanian patriot considered a patriot? Because we keep our Albanian flag in the house and not uh, 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 another uh, uh, person who constantly, uh, uh, let's say, uh, cleans the environment. So which is a better patriot? To me, the one that cleans the environment is a better patriot. So we need to start thinking in these terms. And in, by thinking in these terms, I think that we are going to create those positive identities that Sasha mentioned as well. So by being a good Albanian in the region today, that means to have a clearer environment for all of us which necessarily means that we are going to cooperate with Serbs as well in order to do that, because political borders are not natural borders. So, uh, and uh, uh, by having a, uh, a, a better economic development, which is going to be translated to the well-being of the people, of all people. So this is a common interest as well. So being a good Albanian is actually making sure that we do this together with Serbs, together with Bosniaks, together with Montenegrins and Macedonians and the like. So I think that this is a part of the identity which we need to talk a bit more about. So today being a good Albanian or Serb does not mean fighting with each other. Those are bad Albanian Serbs. Being a good Albanian Serb are those that are cooperating with each other. Yes, exactly. And also I think uh, we saw a bit of that uh, come to surface and it's mentioned also in your publication. We've also covered it at Kosovo 2.0 uh, with a, in Shtrpse in Kosovo with a uh, construction of the small hydropower plants and there was a moment in leading up to 2020, a bit earlier, when citizens, basically, so local Albanians and local Serbs came together to protect a common resource, water, which doesn't, no ethnicity. And uh, also, I do think that maybe with the younger generation, sometimes you see more of uh, identity being uh, defined and embraced along these terms, in, in the terms of what are the struggles of today with regard to ecology or economic uh perspectives in the in the horizon um but i would like to tie this actually with because we've touched on a few different things about um like history and our identity and i want to go a bit maybe on the histories of the from starting from the 80s in in that particular Yugo, yugoslavia because i think also there there's a lot of narratives there's a lot of stories that are kind of being forgotten or pushed to the margins. For example, how in the 80s, the Slovenian social movement was very present in Kosovo when they came and they visited and they actually already saw some of the, the human rights abuses that had, were happening in Kosovo. Then even during the 90s itself, there was cooperation between women in black, a very pacifist, uh, women-based movement. Then there was, I thought of also the Pertei exhibition, which was organized by Veshkil Zermalici and Borka Pavicevic at the Center for Cultural Decontamination in Serbia. There was in 97, when the war <laughs> was about to erupt in Kosovo, the, uh, the, the full war, there was a group of also artists from Kosovo that went to exhibit, uh, to exhibit it in Belgrade, and it was a very important moment for the also contemporary art of, of Kosovo. So you have all these, so I'm just giving a few examples. So you have all of these different things happening, yet it makes me think, how can we make sure that 
research, documentation, and such articulations just don't remain in the margins of uh, of, of knowledge. Do, are you seeing other places where there's academic, not just academic work being produced more to to make sure that we're not forgetting uh, these type of uh, uh, these type of stories, but then also how to bring them to a larger public uh, a public as well. Well, I think two things I would like to happen, and I'm not saying that they are easy. Uh, first is, uh, it is true that we need uh, allies. Uh, we need allies, and uh, it would be very useful to have allies that already have a public profile, and therefore they have uh, a, a much uh, bigger influence. And uh, uh, so this can be done with intellectuals, it can be done, especially it has to be done with media as well. So in order for these activities to take some sort of a positive media coverage, and when I say positive, I mean not to, uh, not, not to trash them in media, because so you, uh, these, these uh, initiatives more often than not in, in, the, in, the, in the hostile media, they are trashed, not, just not being reported. But even when they are reported, they are misinterpreted. Because I think that there are some points of this uh, cooperation. Like, for example, we have the uh, Mirdita Dobardan Festival, which happens every year, and we have uh, joint uh, theater uh, directors uh, doing theater plays and uh, cultural uh, exchange to an extent, uh, but that is being kept on the margin. And I think that sometimes even intentionally be kept on the margin because media say that or think that this would not uh, serve the interest of the people uh, uh, or it would not interest them. And the second thing that should happen, uh, uh, which which, uh, which I see uh, it uh, to be a bit uh, more difficult is, is again, uh, you mentioned the 90s, and I think that it is very important to see how uh, even under those circumstances, which were much more difficult circumstances that we have now, both in Belgrade and Pristina, even in those circumstances, in Belgrade and Pristina, you had brave, courageous intellectuals that stood against the tide. And then... At that time, being against the tide was actually very uh, dangerous, even for your own persona, especially in Belgrade under Milosevic regime. But even then, you had people like Natasha Kandic and Sonia Viserkundas who were talking directly about the crimes that the Serbian regime was uh, was committed. And you don't see something like that happening now, for example, in Pristina. I mean, there are a lot of progressively minded people, but they don't maintain the same profile when and if in public which is very worrisome. So that's why I'm saying that we need these credible people or people who can be viewed as credible by the, uh, by the, uh, by the uh, uh, citizens uh, to be a bit more brave and say these things. Like, for example, this debate that we are having with Alexander, and it's a normal, formal debate. But then even in such level, they don't have the courage to, uh, to, to, to say the things that should be done. For example, we had some cases, like I always mention this case of uh, Ms. Gashish, who returned to uh, Jakova after many years, uh, that she was living outside of her city. And there was protest there uh, uh, of the people of Jakova against her returning to her apartment. And nobody in Pristina said anything about it. Not the president, not the prime minister, none of the intellectuals, none of the media. It was reported, but it remained as such. And I think that these are... Uh, the uh, one of the problems that we see, especially with Kosovo government in the now, is that although in form they tend to be a bit more progressive, so the prime minister uh, 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 does these videos in Serbian, he talks to uh, Kosovo Serbs uh, in their language, but at the same time he's not courageous enough in order for uh, for for uh, him to be active in these important moments when the whole. Uh, society in Kosovo, or all Albanians in Kosovo, think in one way, in a one-dimensional way, and the prime minister does not have the courage to counteract that with the truth. So I think that in this sense, we need more people that are actually uh, uh, going out in public and saying that you are all collectively wrong, because this is not as you are perceiving it. This is like this. Just one more follow-up with you, Visar, before I uh, switch to, to Alexander. To what extent do you see this also connected, this uh, so this reaction or lack of reaction by Kosovo Albanians, to what extent do you, uh, do you see it also connected with what their expectation is from Serbia with regard to responsibility, uh, public apology, recognition of war crimes, of destruction and all of that? Because sometimes I feel that it's because there hasn't truly been 
uh, recognition from uh, uh, from Serbia. It it widens up the opportunity for for people here for for Albanians in Kosovo to be uh, less open to true re- reconciliation. Yeah, I think that it is related to that, and I think that uh, uh, I would say that uh, 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 Serbia is a threat. Obviously, uh, it, it, there is a threat from Serbia, from Kosovo, especially from uh, from uh, uh, government of uh, Alexander Vucic. But at the same time, I think that the way that we perceive the threat, and this is linked to the history as well, uh, is uh, uh, much more exaggerated. So in this sense, I think that uh, we, are, we are doing two mistakes. One is that we are misperceiving the threat from Serbia. And I'm not talking about the intentions of the government. Again, I'm talking about the circumstances which makes this threat much much uh, uh, smaller. And the second thing is that we should not ever do the mistake of equating Serbs to 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 the, to the Serbian government. You know, and this this way of homogenized perception of a people is very problematic and dangerous. And this is what uh, uh, I think Alexander is uh, trying to point out as well. And uh, in in his other book, he actually points out this: there is there is a sort of like a, a a a physiognomy, I would say, a silhouette of what an Albanian is in Serbia, and vice versa. We have a silhouette of what a Serbian is. So it doesn't matter whether he's called Alexander Dragana, he lives in Mitrovica or Belgrade. As soon as he's a Serb, we think we know everything about her or him. They're hostile towards us. Uh, they have been uh, part of a criminal regime. They used to vote for Milosevic. They now like Alexander Vucic, and they want Kosovo to be uh, without any Albanians. So automatically, when you say a Serb, we know the history and the way they think 100%. And this is, nothing is more away from the truth than this. And I think to an extent, same things happen in Serbia towards Albanians as well. Yes, and actually, Alexander has also a, a book in that regard, the Imagining the Albanian, which is uh, uh, which is truly amazing. Uh, it's a, a great publication, great book. Uh, Alexandra, would uh, maybe to switch a bit uh, with you on academia, since also earlier uh, you, uh, you you provided the disclaimer that you're not a p- political analyst, which we know of, and I I wanted to talk maybe to you a bit about the uh, the trend, or maybe this is a trend on, on Twitter especially, uh, but we, we hear more and more like you go nostalgic kind of, is a concept coming up, and actually recently at the K2.0 we had a very interesting uh, interview interview with Paul Stubbs, who's uh, the UK sociologist who studied also Yugoslavia, and he makes this difference between Yugo nostalgia, Yugo amnesia, and Yugo splaining, and. Um, Actually, in this, to focus on the Yugo explaining part, one thing that he that he says that I think was very important is that we have to be careful about Yugo explaining because we need to think also about the internal colonialism and the deep structural violence that happened to Albanians in socialist Yugoslavia. And I think that some. I see this as something that it's uh, more and more being challenged. Also, when you know just individual voices, academics uh, out there. But sometimes I feel like for it to be challenged, kind of it has to come from that group. So it has to come from from the Albanians to say that, okay, well, in this reading of Yugoslavia, you are omitting certain experiences that were also uh, very much, uh, very much important. So how do you think in the context of the, the academia currently in, in, in the region, what are the avenue, avenues where there can be different approach, different learning, different understanding of of Yugoslavia, one that actually also takes into account that it was very complex, that there was not there's not just one one reading uh, of it, and then particularly understanding how different groups within it experienced it as well. Nostalgia is, you know, being investigated a lot and you go nostalgia a lot, and it's uh, it's a pretty potent uh, theoretical an analytical term, you know, um, but there is a really uh, a significant interest, and I guess this interest is not going to go away easily about Yugo nostalgia, because in some ways, and these were, I would say, mostly international scholars who pursue this idea, is that Yugoslavia in some ways survived in memory and in cultural sphere. You know, there are political formations that were there for a long time, but that didn't leave so much traces. But this so-called Yugosphere, like this, you know, you have this 
uh, uh, language that you call different, Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, Macedonian, but it's linguistically the same language and people can uh, uh, speak it together. And I see young Macedonians who don't speak this language as, as their native language, but they are brought up on some, I don't know, pink television, some series is being produced in Serbia and Croatia or in Bosnia, and they pick up this. So in a way, this uh, 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 formation is still active enough to inspire scholarly interest in it. Uh, I am not personally like a, such a huge fan of, of nostalgia because it has to deal a lot of with, with symbolism and with imagining something that is not really realistic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a psychological uh, 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 procedure, you know, of melting something into something different. Or if you want, using bad memories to create uh, uh, a better or a good one. You know, past was, was always was always great. But that being said, I, apart from and aside from nostalgia, I like this idea of talking about relatively recent past, and that is Yugoslavia, uh, in a much more realist, realistic terms. And sometimes you can describe this as nostalgia, but I think uh, uh, some people from former Yugoslavia, and I'll go and say, let's say a lot of Bosnians, Serbs, Macedonians, okay? Unlike anyone else, they actually lived better 30 years ago than they live now, okay? We don't need to necessarily attach that to nostalgia. And I think in that sense, some people from former Yugoslavia are different than the entire Eastern Europe. You know, you go to Bulgaria, you go to Romania, they have their problems, okay? But they never lived better. Majority of people is living better now than they lived 30 years ago. And this is not the case for some people in former Yugoslavia, and that deserves that deserves, uh, you know, a decent treatment. There was something in this political formation that enabled many people to have a dignified life. Many Serbs are having less dignified life now than they used to, and this applies to, to others. So once we are ready to recognize that, and I would go a step further and say that in my view and my knowledge, Perceptions of uh, Yugoslavia are also very negative uh, in Kosovo. However, the fact remains that Albanians in Kosovo lived uh, uh, infinitely better than Albanians in Albania. So uh, I think there is, for me, a reason. Let us look at this political formation and see what were those things that were good for majority of people. And let's not just discard it easily because of this or that ideology. And if we talk about workers' rights, if we talk about employment, if we talk about housing and so on, some assumptions of that country were much be more beneficial to common people than they are now. So in that sense, I would uh, uh, like this, you know, genuine treatment of what was good, what was bad, and if we can pick some lessons and uh, uh, build our political space around these things. I, I would say that in terms of <clears throat> uh, uh, aspirations, now how, what can our people afford, that's a different thing, but in terms of aspirations or in terms of some remnants of welfare state, we might still be exploiting the remnants, you know, the, the, the poor remains of uh, once fairly uh, a prosperous social state with a lot of welfare. Thanks, Alexander. Vissar, maybe just very shortly, how do you see this? So how, what are the ways that we can look at things that maybe in terms of its social model worked, that potentially, that you know, that can be applied also today, but at the same time make sure that... Uh, there is recognition 
of the uh, unequal power relations that also existed within that bigger political uh, uh, structure because there were there threads of colonialist structures as well. So how can we do both, particularly in Kosovo, considering uh, that there is a bit, I feel like today, a lack of understanding or knowledge around the different ways Yugoslavia existed? I think that Yugoslavia and Kosovo, as uh, Sasha pointed out, is is a bad name. So there is no critics, cr- critical view upon it. It's just a bad name. Yugoslavia, it's a no-go. <clears throat> But I think that uh, obviously nobody is claiming or even thinking about uh, rebuilding Yugoslavia. But we have to be- also bear in mind that regional cooperation when it comes to economics and uh, uh, cultural exchange and that, that is going to build a new region, a new dynamics in the region which are going to resemble Uh, 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 something of a, let's say, a mini European Union or anything else. And I think that there are a lot of things within uh, Yugoslavia that needed to be remedied, as you mentioned rightly, Paul Studs and the the colonial sort of like uh, a relationship that Yugoslavia had, especially with Kosovo and Albanians in Yugoslavia in, in particular. Uh, that has to be, obviously, that, uh, that uh, has to be remedied. But also we have to think in terms of how do we see and organize regional cooperation in order for it to become beneficial for the people of the region and not just for the capital in the region. I think that this is the most important thing that Sasha was pointing out as well. So what kind of social organization do we need in terms of trade unions, civil society and other organizations in order to make sure that that regional cooperation on economic terms especially, which is going to happen whether we like it or not, to make sure that that is going to protect our human rights to protect our workers' rights, and to protect our environment. I think that these are the most pressing uh, duties that we have for the future if we call ourselves political activists and if we call ourselves intellectuals on the progressive uh, side. So I think that this is uh, something that needs to be uh, looked upon, and this is more or less what the book uh, actually tries to say on different uh, 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 topics that it tackles. And also there is a particular essay in that book which deals with a cultural Uh, 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 obstacles that we might have in terms of language. Because basically Yugoslavia was a sphere organized around Srpsko, Hrvatsko, so Serbian and Croatian languages was born into one. So all the other people in the Yugoslavia that did not speak Serb or Croatian, they were sort of like alienated in the official language of their country. And now we have to make sure this time around that we find a common ground on this as well. We either Uh, 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 develop a language which is impossible, obviously, uh, or we 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 introduce a language where we would feel equally annihilated, all of us, alienated. Sorry. So in this sense, one of the proposals there is maybe English could serve as the regional language. But this is an important issue to be thought about and posed as a question, because people would need to feel at home in whatever sort of a construction that the region is going to become. If we have some people not feeling at home, as Albanians did not feel at home in Yugoslavia, then this is not going to be a project which is going to last for a very long time, and obviously not a project which is going to serve the benefit of all. Thank you, Vissar, for actually bringing the book back into this, because uh, as you were speaking, I was thinking about that, especially that particularly, that actually the book does that. And uh, the book really does bring very interesting perspectives uh, into into one place. Uh, it's called Kosovo, Serbia, a different approach. So I would recommend everybody to go to the institute, both institute pages and uh, and to, to give it a look. Thank you so much both for being on the show. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I think it was a great conversation. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thank you from my side as well. And to be sad to be, for being such a, you know, grateful correspondent. Other Talking Points is a K2.0 podcast. You can listen to it regularly on our website, kosovo2.0.com, or by subscribing to Kosovo 2.0 on Spotify. <laughs>